All right, uh, speaking of participation, uh, who's excited to be here? All right, all right, perfect. See some familiar faces. I think everyone who's here, uh, I'm excited to be here because we're all sort of interested in what makes us do things. Specifically, why do we buy things we buy? When we buy them, why do I buy something that you don't? And all these things that go into those decision-making uh, processes. So what I want to do today is I want to actually walk through some of, the, some of the manipulation tools and other things at the disposal of retailers that can create cognitive processes in us without us even knowing it that make us decide when we buy things. So a couple of the big things we're going to talk about are pricing and discounts. We're going to talk about risk aversion. We're going to get into what scarcity does. Um, and then we're going to talk about the regret that can come from our decisions. Um, so a lot to sort of parse through and actually along the way we're going to run some experiments and by the end of it my goal is that we'll have learned enough in the last couple minutes that we can actually predict the behavior of a couple very lucky participants that will uh, replicate a study I've done um, over the last year or so. So that's the agenda. Does it sound like a game plan to you guys? Yes. Good. All right, let's do it. So first thing to talk about is risk. And I thought, what better way to get some audience participation than to give people money? So I would like 10 volunteers. And the only thing you need to know right now is that I'm going to give you a dollar, and it is yours to keep. So can I have 10 people? I got it. Two over eight. Okay. There's one. These are, these are real dollars. Uh, what is that? Three, four, five, six. Will is getting one. Seven. No, eight. And two more. And I, I got a, sorry, I got a, I got a student. Uh, this is not bribery. Okay. Uh, okay, now you guys have a decision. We're, we're going to, everyone that has a dollar, Right now you have a choice. You can keep the dollar or we can flip a coin and if you guess right, you get, you get two more dollars, so you get three total dollars. If you get it wrong, I get the dollar back. So come up to stage if you want to flip the, if you want to flip the coin. Okay, we got one. Is it head or tail? Head or tail. Two, three, four. We got five. Okay, perfect. All right, so here we go. I'll do everything digital. I don't even have a real coin. We're going to do it on the screen. You can, you, no, you can trust the internet. Okay. So, all right, what's your name? Lucy. Lucy, heads or tails? Tails. Oh, all right, Lucy. All right, you win. Okay. And you, you, Chris? I would like tails, please. Don't cheat. Oh, wow, two for two. My experiment is already crumbling. Okay, what's your name? Karen. Karen, heads or tails? It seems to be working. Heads. Carol. Okay. Joe, heads or tails? Heads. Oh, back. All right. Taylor, what do you want? We're going to do heads. Heads. All right, there you go. Okay. Uh, thank you to our participants. You guys can have a seat. Oh, sorry, Will, my man. Sorry, what do you want? Tails. Tails. I better hit hails now. Oh, yeah. oh shoot, it is, was that not on screen? Uh, wow, okay, sorry about that. That should have been uh, visible. All right, I might need to get that on the screen. I don't know how to do that because of the survey, but okay, let's keep going. All right, so what we just witnessed were people who are loss averse and people who are not so loss averse. The people that just said, Give me that dollar, I'm good to go. Those are people that you know, are not as risk taking. Uh, they're sort of, I would say, like I am. I'm sort of cautious, get to the airport early, don't want to get stuck in traffic and miss the flight. The people that rolled the dice, Chris and Will and Carol and, and, and company, they were more uh, willing to, to risk a little bit. And so this comes to the idea of trade-offs. Everything is a trade-off. We're all, most of us are drinking a cup of coffee. What does a cup of coffee cost at this cafe? Two dollars. $2? Okay. So every time you decide, unless you got a free one, to buy a cup of coffee, in that moment you're essentially saying that that $2, that coffee is the most valuable thing you can do with that 
It's, you're gonna get more enjoyment out of that than anything else. You can never get that $2 back, right? In that moment, sure, Joe. But if you had given me $10 and not a dollar, I might have kept it and not played your game. Okay, so, so that's so definitely part of it. Money involved is a crucial element of how much you're willing to take risks. Repeat. Absolutely. So if, if it, let, let's use that as an experiment. If, we, if I had given you $10 and said, if you roll, if you flip it, you get 30. If you hit it or you lose the $10, would that have changed things? Yes. Would you have kept it? The fact that it was only a dollar, it yeah. wasn't much to risk. Right. What if it was a thousand bucks? Oh. Right? So definitely the, uh, the amount plays a factor. Yeah. The other factor is you're, you're betting with somebody else's money. <laughs> right. So if you go to Vegas and you get a bunch of quarters in your room as a part of I would gamble that because I haven't lost anything personally. Right. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You're playing with the house money, so to speak, right? Oh, sorry. So the question of thought is, if you're playing basically with the house money, then you look at it differently, as opposed to if I said, everyone pull out a dollar of your wallet. Absolutely, good point. And so all of these go into our decision-making criterion. But I've always been fascinated with trade-offs because you can always do something differently. You spend that $2 on coffee, you're never getting it back. So let's talk more about risk and risk aversion. It's fourth and goal on the five yard line. Your team is down by three points. The prospect, you have two choices, right? The prospect, one, kick the field goal, tie it up. Low value, but very high probability. The other choice is you go for the touchdown. Way more satisfaction, higher value, but probability is lower. Let's look, let's use a real world example. Okay, this is me in high school. Um, when I wanted to go to the prom, I had, uh, there was Sarah Wachowski, who I really wanted to ask, and she was, you know, out of my league, beautiful, smart, all of those things, and so had she gone to the prom with me, my excitement and happiness level would have probably been a 9 out of 10, but my wife is here in the crowd, by the way, not Sarah Wachowski, um, but the probability of her going with me, not to whiteboard this out, would probably be about, you know, 2, or, uh, two out of 10, so point, uh, or yeah, so point nine and point two. However, I knew that she was out of my league. She was a tier three. I was about a tier one in high school, so she's like a, got a tier between me. So I thought maybe I'll ask, uh, I'll ask Shelby Mitchell. She was in my tier, maybe tier two, and so the satisfaction of her going with me would have been about a seven out of ten, point seven, but the probability would have been higher, was higher because she wasn't so far out of my league. So if you look at that prospect, the prospect of going with Shelby, that you, I know you can't read that, is higher. And so you go with the higher probability. Except in times, <laughs> this is not Shelby either. <laughs> uh, I incidentally ended up marrying a tier one at the end of the day. Just uh, it took me a little while to go from this. Yeah. <laughs> so, in general, we choose that higher prospect, that's what we call this, probability and value. However, there are certain times when we're irrational. One of those times, this might not work because of the screen, so if it doesn't, so just, am I gonna have to, uh, all right, I might just not, is it gonna keep going back and forth? You know what? Yeah, it's okay. I'll just, uh, I'll just do this. All right, so um, the idea is, and I was going to have you do a survey, but it might just do show of hands. So your choice is, right now, I can give you a free one-week trip to Italy, or we'll flip the coin again, and if you lose, you get nothing, but if you win, you get a three-week trip to Italy. So just show of hands, how many people are taking that one week trip? Okay, how many of you are rolling the dice? My super risk averse people, okay. And so the point is, if you, if, you, if you map out three weeks, every other time ends up being more days in Italy. So we tend to overvalue certain things. We also overvalue very low probabilities. And again, I won't do the survey, but how about this, you have a you have a 10% chance of a one-week trip to Italy or a 5% chance of a three-week trip to Italy. How many people would take the 5% chance of a three-week trip to Italy? 
how many would take the 10% out of the one? Okay, and so that time, if you notice, a lot more people were willing to really risk on that low probability. But again, if you map that out, it's the same difference between the first one, except we had vastly different reasons. So we overvalue low probabilities. We, we overvalue certainty. Um, you see this all the time. Great quote from Dumb and Dumber. He says, what are the odds you go out with me? It's like me and Sarah Wachowski. And she says, oh, about one in a million. And of course he says, so you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> he was actually inspired by that. And we see this all the time. We have Powerball, we have lottery, we have gambling slot machines. We're okay with very low probabilities sometimes. The last experiment, again, I'm, I'm going to not use it, is this is, uh, this is going to be important moving forward. You have, I want you to consider two things. One scenario, scenario A, you're walking down the street and you find a $20 bill on the ground. How happy does that make you feel? Second scenario is you're walking down the street and you get home and you realize, you check your wallet, you realize you lost the $20 bill on the street. And what I want to ask is what feeling is stronger, the happiness of finding the $20 bill or the dissatisfaction of losing it? The happiness. What do you guys, how many think the, the, that you'd be, for lack of a better word, you'd be more upset, angry about losing it than you would be happy about gaining it? Okay, and that's pretty, and then so that, that looks like definitely three quarters or more. So that is, the tr that is true as well. We really don't like to lose things. So let's keep going along. Let's talk pricing. Um, this one, I was going to have break the room in half and have people do earmuffs and close their eyes, but I don't think I'm going to do that. Um, I'm just going to give you the takeaway from this experiment. Um, famous fear experiment that shows the power of something that's free. Uh, so I was going to say pizza, but the actual experiment was Dan Ariely. Um, he was at Duke University, and on two, in two cafeterias on the same day, he had two options. There was a bowl of Dove chocolate for 26 cents and Hershey Kisses for a penny. And then in another cafeteria, there was, Hers there was Dove chocolate for 25 cents and Hershey Kisses were free. So what do you think he found? Do you think more people chose the penny Hershey Kiss or more people chose the free Hershey Kiss? Free. The free. So Chris is going against the... the <laughs> kind of lame Duke researcher, um, but yes, so that showed the power of free. It was the same exact difference, and people like things are free. Why is that? Because it takes risk out of the equation. We don't like risk, we don't like what comes from risk, and so free is important. Going a little bit more with prices, what are we looking at? A sub, right? And we're not going to affiliate it. What would be the lowest amount you think you could buy this for in, in Athens? Uh, I'm just kidding. It's a foot long. I said it's a foot long. So, what's the lowest you would pay? You think five bucks? What's the highest you might pay? Seven, eight, or nine. Okay, so seemed like five was low. Seven, nine, nine. So that we just created ourselves our anchor and our reference price and our range of prices. So that's important. We all establish these things. Think about when you go to Kroger, you go to any store, you're constantly looking at a product and it has to hit that range or else you start asking yourself questions. This has come into play famously with the dollar menu. Uh, I almost exclusively ate at McDonald's, uh, the dollar menu in the 90s. And, um, and one of the problems that they ran into though is that we got really excited about getting a hamburger for a dollar. And consumers are fickle and we did not want to change that. And so what did they do? Instead of raising the prices, cost of beef, inflation, does anyone know what they did, McDonald's, instead of to keep the dollar menu? Smaller. 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 There was like, it started shrinking, right? Actually, the first thing they did was like remove a pickle, and then they started shrinking the burger, and then eventually and it was like a, a slider. But they decided it was better to do that than say, now hamburgers are $1.15 or $1.08. And that's changed a little bit since then, but that shows us about pricing. Did anyone get the new iPhone, 10? How much does this baby cost? $9.99. Is that in your reference price range for an iPhone? No. no. But why did they do that? So they know that. Like they, yeah, so why, why did they say, we understand your price range is, what, three to seven hundred? Whatever it is. Why did they go, why did they do that? Why do you think? What's their strategy? Change the, yeah. Bring, change reference point over time. There also is a strategic move to show you this is way more high quality than the last version. And so that sends a lot of signals. We take a lot from prices, even if we don't know the quality. So that is very strategic. 
some other things that, uh, that companies have at play to manipulate how we think about our own money. Um, what's your name? I'm going to use you. Harrison? Okay, I'm going to use Harrison as an example. Harrison is checking out from Kroger. And what's your name? Nancy is behind him. And Harrison is buying some things and I'm scanning them. I'm like, did you find everything you need? Yeah, okay. Your bill is $32.15. Would you like to round up to the next dollar for the food pantry? No, okay. <laughs> Harrison sticks his ground. Uh, had Harrison said yes, I would say that's probably because it's a public forum. Nancy's right behind him. We have the social pressure. So all this to say firms and retailers have a lot of things at their disposal to sort of influence how, how and when we buy. Prices. There is so much literature. Um, we know why people do 99 instead of $5, right? Seems a little cheaper. There is literature, or there is research people are digging into Target and Costco, and they've formulated if it ends in a 9.2, that means it's the lowest price you're going to get. At Target, if the price ends in a 0.6 or 0.8, that means it's still got some distance to go down. So all of these things, these are all the heuristics that we're using all the time to make decisions. Moving on to discounts. We love us some sales, right? Who in here loves going and finding something and seeing it marked down? You're like, boom. Why do you think that makes us feel good? Or why does it make you feel good? You get more for your money. More for your money, right? Good, more for your money? You feel like you're actually getting the real cost of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially with like clothes. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're, you, you feel like you're not, mark, you're taking, not being taken advantage of by the markups, the brands, rock. Somebody else might have bought it, but you got a better price. Ah, yeah. Yeah. You yeah, and so that brings up the idea of winning. You know, we sort of like the competition of it. You feel good when you got to sell. Everything you're saying are those, um, emo or, uh, those judgment value pieces that go into these decisions. So you reduce price. A couple examples. So seasonal discount. Why do you think that, you know, immediately on December 26th, all of the wreaths, the Christmas wreaths are on sale? <laughs> couple re so obvious reasons. Christmas is over. But, yeah, that... that they don't want to pack them away. That is taking up. Sorry, Harrison. Exactly. So they want to make some money off it, right? They want to make as much as they can off everything. And I will sort of go on top of that and say, do you think that they have anything in their storage and their inventory that they can put on that shelf once the wreaths are gone? Yes. So they want to clear shelf space. They want to get a little value before they clear the shelf space. Why do you think that the firms keep the price tag on there that they crossed out? Why do, why do they not just say like, this wine is now $9.99, not $24.99? Reference point, show you the deal. Uh -huh. They're going to say too? Oh yeah, just like the comparison between the two is so different. Exactly, good. Yeah, we like to feel smart, right? We, like we made a great decision. Um, so everything they're saying, you know, that, that you get more value, more money. I pretty much exclusively buy wine by looking at these two prices and buying on the biggest difference. And, and my wife actually does know that. So, all right. All right, now we're moving into scarcity. And this is getting into some of the real topics that uh, I did my research in. Again, I'm not going to use the, the online poll. Uh, instead, I think I'm going to, you're going to have to trust me on how this works. But what the question would be was, if I just showed you right now, well, in real life, if you went to The Gap or someplace, Elder Beerman, and you came up to a table, and there was a table with 15 pairs of jeans on it. And then you went to another table, and there was one or two pairs of jeans on it, like they had been already bought. Which jeans, just on that information, for all intents and purposes, they're exact same. What jeans do you think would be higher quality? The, the one with one or two pairs or the one with 15 pairs? One or two. And so lots of research shows that if we only have one queue available and it's availability, it's the amount of something, we are going to make that seem, um, we're, we're going to give more value to that when we make our prospect, our judgment. Okay? So that is an important part of, of what scarcity does. What is scarcity? In a nutshell, I have this when, when yeah, demand exceeds supply. That's kind of any better, any better way of phrasing it. Do you guys know of 
sort of seems economic-y and I, so I grew up in a house with six siblings. I was the third nameless kid of seven, right? And so I had a decision to make every morning. I could sleep in for five extra minutes or I could get down to the cereal before it was gone. You know, there's a box every morning, four brothers, two sisters, late sleeper. That, that box of cereal is a scarce resource. It's prom night, I'm going to take Becky on, on prom. I need the car keys. That car, I better get those at about three in the afternoon because that car is a scarce resource. There's one, we're all sharing it. My brothers don't care that I, I finally got a date. So this is the <laughs> scarce resource. Um, okay, so let me ask you, well, let's, let's talk about what scarcity does. Who would be interested in this jacket from Patagonia? Anyone? Taylor, you're my, all right. So if you were gonna buy this normally, what would be your buying process? What would you do? Perfect. Okay. Read the reviews, check the prices, make sure it had all the um, functions and features you wanted. This website is called steepandcheap.com. This is a screen capture I took today. Every time you click on it, and I would now, but we're having some issues with that. When you click on it, a new deal starts every five minutes, and this timer just goes down, and then it's gone. And so, why do you think they do that? Because they basically take everything we like to do out of the equation. You can't read reviews, you can't check the prices, you can't check for features. And so what scarcity does, it makes us think things are more valuable and it also limits the amount of information we can process. And research now shows that when scarcity is really intense like this, that becomes the fundamental factor we use to make a decision. So you see a, a clicking time and you're like, ah, I'll take it, right? That's what we do because you don't want to miss the opportunity. Same reason that candy bars are, you know, we, we've heard impulse buying. Candy bars are near the checkout. You know, I don't think Nestle or Kit Kat wants you to sort of think about what the Reese's Pieces are going to do to you. Um, you know, they just want you to get hungry and buy it. Who's famous for scarcity or who's really good at using this? Any fans of the Slap Chop Sham? Well, I don't want to say fans because he did some weird stuff later. But great example of someone who uses scarcity like a pro. Not only product scarcity, time scarcity. And if you watch these commercials, they can be on at one in the afternoon, one in the morning, five in the afternoon, it doesn't matter when it's on. At the end, he always says, you know we can't do this all day. There's only 20 minutes left for this deal. So you're like, oh, I need a sham wow, really bad. I can't, I can't think about it anymore. Corbett says that too. When you're looking at tickets, they'll say two seats left at this price. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, think about all the time, you're on Hotels.com, 17 people are looking at this hotel right now. That's their method of saying like, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I was going to say, that's perfect. Okay, so <laughs> we have scarcity. So let's combine all these things together. What do we know? Uh, discounts can make us a little bit, uh, I don't say crazy, but they get us emotional. They get us attached to things. Scarcity changes how we perceive things. So what happens when you start mixing and matching these together? We have things like Black Friday. And Black Friday, if you think about all the trade-offs that you're incurring, you know, you're getting up early, you're uh, waiting in line, you are you know, investing time versus energy. Um, great little meme here, The Walking Dead or Black Friday, you decide. Um, I have, and, and I'll segue into the last piece, which is regret. So lots of factors here making you decide, I need to go to Target at 6 a.m. or now, it's like midnight the night before, um, so that I can get this product. But then I'm out, I'm shopping, I'll buy some more things. So there's lots of reasons they do this. Back when stores still open at 6 a.m., now they open at right midnight, right, on, on Thanksgiving. Um, my sister really wanted a laptop, and I said I would go with her to, I think it was Best Buy. So we got there at 4.30 in the morning, camped out, you know, we're cold. And I talked with you folks earlier, not a shopper, like not my thing, ironically. Uh, but so I'm sitting with my sister and then they finally open the door. And when you walk in the door, they have a coupon. The first 10 people are there for the laptop. So we're getting there closer and we see the pile thinning out. And then we get there and the last one is gone. So that was the only thing we wanted. So we drove home depressed and, uh, yeah, question. Where does convenience fit into your equation? 
that is, I'd rather be home, order it on Amazon, and not go through all this stuff. I mean, it's kind of crazy that th that what I just described to my sister, I would never do in 2017 because of Cyber Monday and other deals. So people want, well, that's a good way to think people or firms want us to avoid, this was my sister after that happened, you know, people want <laughs> you to not experience that much negative utility or dissatisfaction. Uh, convenience is going to be a big part of the last uh, little experiment. No, no, that's a really good point because you're weighing not just your money, it's not just a money exchange for product, it's a money exchange for time, energy, effort. People, who here when they buy something on Amazon has like five browsers open, checking reviews and, and doing all that kind of stuff? I, that's me too because we want to make the best decision possible. That's what, like back to the earlier point, scarcity does. So the last piece then is regret. I said earlier I don't like risk. The reason is that I hate regret. Um, I experience it very with a lot of salience, a lot of strength. So I do everything in my power and I'm not going to regret losing my dollar or I'm not going to regret keeping my dollar if I'm the first person in that experiment as much as I'm going to regret flipping the coin and losing the three dollars. So let's talk about regret. What is regret? I'll ask the audience, how many people have purchased something that they later wish they hadn't? Okay, that's the no-brainer question. What is regret? Well, I'm going to ask you, what do you, how would you define regret in a nutshell? Poor quality. Poor quality, what is that? Unsatisfied feeling. Unsatisfied feeling? Really no use for it. No use for it, right? We actually have the term buyer's remorse, right? We feel remorse. Every time you buy something, you know, and as I said earlier with the coffee, you made a decision, you can't spend that money on something else. But every decision we make, we immediately compare that to every other possible outcome, right? So, for instance, what if I had later found out that Sarah Wachowski would have gone with me? That would have been a ton of regret, right? So you immediately, I, I didn't realize how awkward it would be with my wife here saying these uh, things. You, you immediately start comparing and back to the convenience, all these things we factor in, we don't like that. You are at dinner and you decide, you decide between desserts and you're with your friend and you get the, the lemon sorbet and they get the chocolate molten lava cake, your sorbet comes out and it's like a little melty and, and then your friend gets this and you're like, I'm going to have a piece of that, right? You'll regret it. One of, the three, one of the things that firms are trying to do to keep us from that buyer remorse is they offer things like the price match guarantee, right? So you are at Walmart, any of, the, any of the big box retailers, and sometimes they'll say, we don't want you to go home and feel like you made a mistake because then that you'll, you will have disloyalty for our company and you may not shop here again. So this is one of the things that goes into that. Last piece before I actually do my experiment and see if it holds somewhat is the concept of the omission bias in a regret standpoint. So when you typically commit an act, you feel the result of that more strongly than when you refrain from action. So I have an example. It can be for a, a good thing or a bad thing. So this would never happen because uh, Bobcat Nation is amazing, but you're taking a Scantron test and your friends ahead of you and their arms off the table and they're falling asleep and their whole answer key is just right there. And so you look at all the answers and you fill it in. How does that compare to your friend before the exam says, hey, I didn't study. Do you mind if I just like look off your paper? And you sort of go like this. What do you think makes, this, uh, makes you, all right, so later on you regret whatever decision you made. Which one do you think makes you feel more regret, more remorseful, more, worse about yourself? Letting someone cheat off you or actively cheating on somebody? Actively cheating, thank you, you're my go-to pupil. Um, yes, so that is what they just, that's what research has shown. Because you're committing the act, it feels like it's more, uh, you're more invested in it. So to my experiment, and this is where I want to see if it holds up, I do need a volunteer. Um, and I'm looking for someone who is a real big fan of music, loves music. Okay, we've got two over here. Uh, I'll go with Rob. Yeah, actually, come on up. Yeah. Okay, so Rob, it's actually a good idea. Let's give a round for Rob. So Rob loves music, really passionate about it. Um, and I, I disclaimer, I do know Rob, and, and he's an excellent musician himself. But let's talk about this. So what's your favorite band, bar none? 
Do you have it's easy. It's Rush. 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 Okay. There we go. We have Rush as the band of choice. So what if tomorrow, I'm assuming you're on the Rush newsletter or something oh, yeah. like that, oh, okay. you get a newsletter and it says, Rush is releasing a previously um, unreleased album of their first ever concert live in Toronto, maybe? Yeah, Toronto. It, live in Toronto, and it's a limited release. There's, uh, we're just releasing it on vinyl or CD, and you know, there's only a few out there, and it's never been heard before. So, question, how much would you pay for that album? <laughs> I would pay a lot. For a lot, album. okay. Like, 100 bucks? Uh, yeah. Okay, let's take 100 bucks. Okay, so Rob is walking down, and I know these guys are closing on Saturday, so, uh, but we'll still use them as an example. He's walking by Hoffa, and he, go, and he sees in the window two of these albums, either CD or vinyl, whatever you want. So there's two copies there, but above it, and we're going to say that $100 is a lot, and that's the amount Rob's willing to pay. Above it is a sign that says $110 for the, for the album. And... There's also a sign that says, now through Friday, $110. On Saturday, 50% off. So Rob has a real tough decision. So I don't want you to answer, actually. Um, what I want to do is I want us to decide how Rob will act. So what do we know? Rob loves music. That's a big part of this, right? Involvement, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, this is a pretty scarce product. Scarcity drives interest, desire. It has a perceivability that it's more important than anything else. There's also a discount in play. We know that we like to win. We like to get more value for our money. If you think about it, there's the sure thing of even buying it right now for $110, which is a really good prospect. But better than that would be to buy it in three days for $55. So how is he weighing those prospects? So a lot of things, and um, Rob, earmuffs for one second. So, well actually, yeah, if you, uh, if you think Rob will buy, say yes, if you think, oh, it's silly. You think Rob's gonna buy it on the spot? Yes. 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 How many, if, do you think he's not gonna buy it on the spot? Wait till a couple people. Okay, Rob, un earmuffs. I actually think he's gonna buy both. Okay, <laughs> Rob, un All right. Perfect, per he was really doing the earmuffs. So. Rob, will you buy that album? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, you guys are right. All right, so, good, 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 good. That was the right choice. That was the right choice. Um, yeah, and you can, thanks very much. So what we just saw is everything we've been learning about come into play. Now, a big part of it in the research that I just used by asking someone interested in music is that obviously it might be different if you are not a big music person. That's gonna happen across the board. But if, the, if that ca characteristic is there, that scarcity is going to trump discount because it comes back to the very first thing, the dollar versus the three dollar, right? We like the sure thing. It comes back to everyone that raised their hand about wanting a one-week trip over a 50% chance of a three-week trip, right? We're willing to take a modest gain if it's a sure thing over a slightly better gain, which would be a cheaper album. Okay, last thing, I need another volunteer who is interested and loves music a lot. Oh, did I see? No, it's okay. Anyone else really like music a lot? Like, yeah, you want to join? You want to do it? All right. Oh, sorry, Harrison. Okay. So, do you have? Do you collect vinyl or CDs or anything like that? Uh, I mean, I guess CDs a little, not a ton. Okay, right, we'll do CDs. Um, first of all, what's your name? Max. Max. Okay, let's give it up for Max real quick. <laughs> so, what's your favorite band, Max? I'd go with, uh, I don't know, maybe like Ario Speedwagon. Oh, wow. You just made some strong friends over there. All right, Ario Speedwagon. So, same thing. Let's just say that the same exact situation happens. Okay. Well, actually, first of all, what would you pay for what I described to Rob if it was Ario Speedwagon? Unreleased, new album, but there was only a few out there. What would you pay for that CD or what, however you'd consume it? Uh... I don't know, I'd probably say around the same thing, like 100 Like 100 bucks? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so, I'm gonna decide for you right now. I'm going to decide, this is the last part of the experiment. So Rob, I'm gonna say that you did not buy it, okay? You decided you're gonna come back and try and get it for $55. Okay. So, Rob comes back on Saturday, he's got his 55 bucks, and he gets in there, 
and they're both gone. Keep that in your head. Now, the other side is Rob bought the one, right? He bought it for 110 bucks. He comes back on Saturday and son of a gun, there's one there for 55 bucks. So you have Rob who bought, but bought, spent too much money. And you have Max who decided to wait and now it's gone. So you, I guess I'm not gonna, you don't even need to do earmuffs. Who do you think is it going to experience stronger regret? Who is going to, and this is what we actually studied, who in that situation has worse feelings, feels worse about themselves? So how many people say Rob? How many people say Max? All right, the Max people are correct. Um, so first of all, thank you guys very much. I'm getting, yeah, thanks. Yep. Thank so Max regrets it because he got nothing of the deal, right? He, he risked more and got nothing. And so what we found is even though he saved some cash, we always prefer the sure thing and we really don't like to lose things, right? That disutility component. So we successfully recreated what I actually found in um, three studies. I did it with, with um, albums and I also did it with jeans, a flea market scenario and a more retail JCPenney or uh, that type of scenario. And that's what happened across the board. Yeah, Rox. Um, no, oh, sorry. Uh, the question was, do age, is, is age a factor? Do people of different ages act differently? Um, you know, we did, we controlled for things like age and, and gender. We found lots of things. It was more specific to people because we were asking questions like, do you find shopping boring or do you find it an adventure? Do you, uh, risk aversion. And those were much stronger factors than age because some people like the hunt and the bargain. Um, but that's a great point because what, is your, what would be your hypothesis, actually? I would, I would think that, like my mother's generation, you know, where they came out of, you know, World War II babies, they're, right. they, you know, they, they're very conservative, highly right. conservative. Right. Whereas my son, the millennial, is like, ah, oh, what the heck? Yeah. So, <laughs> but, yeah, so that's back to that risk aversion, which is, you know, the whole theme of this semester. Great point. I have one thing left to talk about and then more, any questions you have. So what's this all mean? When you think about what we just went through, there's a lot that's sort of underneath every pricing decision, every discount that a, a, a company, a retailer uses. So Zara is, they have, they was coined the term tantalizing exclusivity. Anyone shopped at a Zara's before? Oh, you did? Okay. Harrison, the expert in Zara. So, do they, do, does Zara's have a table with 20 of something on it? Yeah, like, um, they will have a lot of stuff, you know, for regular price, and then after a while, they you know, like, they want to get that sale, so they yeah. like, $25. So, Zara's has a lot of stuff, but they go on sale quickly. They have a really fast turnover, and the tantalizing exclusivity that they, that they use is they like to have a, only one or two or three of something. So, you walk in there and it's not a rack of 10 shirts, you're like, I better buy this now before it, you know, before it goes on, before it's gone. Um, so what does that do? What's the point of that? Think, uh, try to think a little down the line. Impulse buying. Impulse buying? You won't wait for the bargain. You won't wait for the bargain? Excellent. That's sort of the, the major takeaway, scarcity. Uh, um, so, obvious, there's, so one of the parts is scarcity, right? We're taking away your decision power because have you ever been shopping with and there's one thing on sale, garage sale flea market, somebody's looking over your shoulder and you're like boxing them out to make sure you get the REO Speedwagon album or something? So the other thing this does, the reason why I want us to like, or the reason I like to think of firms, manipulation is too strong, but not really. Firms manipulating how we think is what else does that do? If you know that they have a high turnover, what are you, and, and you live near Zara's? You're gonna go all the time. So they get you in there all the time because you want to see what's the fresh item. You want to go check so you don't miss anything. Okay. Yeah. And so the possible downside is of course, how many times is Harrison or is Max, sorry, going to go try to buy something and it's gone every time. He's like, wait, this discount never takes effect. So they're charging full price, higher than full price. And I'll be honest, I'm starting to get a little mad because I missed the deal. So there's this possible negative consequences. I think ethics comes into it a little bit. Should you manipulate your customer? Or are they going to resent you after a while? But what's in it for us as customers? You know, the, the, the talk today is you know, to buy or not to buy. That is a question. And I'm going to say it's up to you. That's a real clever way of saying I don't have the answers. But um, I have apples to oranges because 
think about the, the music example and how some people would be very willing to pay a lot of money for a favorite album. Some people out there are like, yeah, music, you know, take it or, or leave it. Or same thing with fashion jeans. We have, so this was a big part of how we think, right? Are you, we call it involvement with the product. How involved are you with the product? So that is going to dictate a lot. But if you're a company, you also don't want you know, that information overload. You don't want decision complication. And uh, we started to feel manipulated. Uh, back, what was your name again? John's very long ago question was about convenience. And that's why, you know, especially living in Athens, I think we're probably all online shoppers to some degree. But maybe you don't want to walk to, um, to you don't want to go to Hafez on Saturday. You know, you value your time over, over money. So there's lots of things at play here. And the, and the takeaway for me is that companies, retailers know that. And if they can get you to sort of fast track your strategy and, and uh, not use all of the normal processing things like we like, like Taylor mentioned, you know, reviews and price checking. If they can make you make a decision not based on those smart cognitive factors, that's going to be a good thing for them. They'll get more traffic and they'll get higher sales volume. So for us, the takeaway is sort of be aware that everything is a strategic move on the part of the retailer. So with that, I'll just open it to questions. Sure. Yeah. Wouldn't you find that one's financial situation would make a big difference in whether you're willing to wait for that sale? If I if my if I'm really tight on money, sure. I'll wait for the sale. But if I'm feeling like my checkbook is full, uh, I'll pay the full price first and not wait for the sale. So So, so yeah, the question is does timing matter? And that's a good point. So I would love to somehow see Paycheck day, I bet more people would just, I bet Max just buys it. He's like, I don't, I don't want to risk it, I got some money. Where if it's the 13th day before the paycheck and you're eating like the can of beans because you're tight on money, maybe not. So good point, very good point. Exactly. Why would you take what you've just given us here, apply it to somebody who owns their own car or cars, has no mortgage to pay, has a very nice retirement, and they don't need more stuff. They're putting it in a closet to take it to you, do to you shops and all that sort of thing. Does any of this apply to those kinds of folks? Well, I guess the, the, the so the question is, um, what if you, what's your name again? Bob. Bob, what if you're just crushing life and everything's honky dory, <laughs> and you're you're trying to get rid of stuff, and so that's a good point. I think for me, or it comes down to again utility or satisfaction. What do you gain from having something versus not having something? Um, I think. In this specific context, if it's a very high profile item, like I don't know if you're a big music person, you might still be willing to, t if it was you in this situation, you probably wouldn't ask, think twice, you'd buy it because it's worth it, you have the funds to do it. Um, as far as I'm trying to think of applying this to something other than just stuff, products, um, where you would be basically balancing decisions based on availability. Um, you know, things wear up, even if you're nowhere in the right. place. Right. But it's not in addition to it. But like an experience, like right. we were talking about like the trip to Italy. Right. You know, if you're in retirement, you have no more to pay, you're crushing life. Right. You might be willing to do more for an experience at that point and less for the stuff. Right, that's true. If, it's, if this was applied to an experiential um, experience, if this was applied to a trip or something, maybe the same heuristics would apply. You know, you're like, I'm not risking coming back if it's like you can you can have this trip to Italy right now for 5000 or you can come back next weekend if there's one still one passage left it'll be 3000 you'd be like I'm going to Italy man all right so maybe that would apply that's a good very really good point thank you yeah does uh that uh, so one of the one things that we asked the the, the uh, people in like some of the surveys we've taken is you know the enjoyment you get from shopping, how good does it feel to make a good purchase, how bad do you feel to make a bad purchase, do you get into entertainment value, do you like beating someone else in a, in a deal, um, and so it is very specific to the person. Um, I don't, I mean we all I think have read enough to know that stuff doesn't make us happy, they continue to do the studies, it's experiences, uh, and it's not accumulating stuff, but the Black Friday is a good example. Some people love the, the, the ritual, the routine, or not the routine, the ritual of it. You know, they have their whole family, and it's an event. It's bigger than Thanksgiving. I would say those people, 
they would. They would value and they would, that would make them happy. So that's a good question. Very person specific. Yeah. Uh, well, so that's a good point. So the question is necessity versus luxury product. And, you know, the, I would say the, C, the, the music example versus the jeans is sort of along those lines. You know, the, uh, uh, an album is a lot different product than a pair of jeans. And so we saw that people uh, would still, well, this is when it came down to personal preferences. It came down to some people who really wanted to look good. So, we, you know, is fashion important to you? And those people, if they answered high on that, they would do the same thing Rob did. They'd buy the pair of jeans before it went on sale. But m way more people in that study decided to wait and, and just see if it would go on sale. So my guess is you go down from jeans to, what's another, like toilet paper. Yeah, I'm going to wait till, I'm going to come back and keep risking it until, uh, you got to have, have one roll back at the house. But, but you might, so that's a good point. I think the products spectrum, and, and let's be honest, like I said, how involved you are with the product, you, no one's really, and toilet paper now is the example we're using, uh, no one is highly involved or no one cares about toilet paper the way they do about music or, or something like that. So it definitely is, I think, um, and even just in the jeans and the album, it's very much tied to the type of product. Uh, the apples versus oranges, I think, is what I was trying to make that point too. It's, it's, the type of product is also how two different people interpret their value derived from the same product. Good question. Yeah. What Bob. about the automobile dealerships that say, drive it for three days, drive it for five days, if you don't like it, bring it back. What are they doing there? They're trying to, are they trying to address regret? Or they, well, okay, so I got my other sales professor out there, and uh, we talk about the used car salesman, and Mick will know this. Uh, so one thing that, if, and we, the question is about, um, what's it called, when you, a test driving cars has moved from drive it for an hour with your dealer to drive it home and bring it back on Monday. So why do you, that's a good question and I have an answer. Why do you guys think they do that? Taylor knows. It's to build like an emotional attachment to it. Yeah. You take it home to your family, you get used to it, you like it, right. and then you don't want to give it back. So that, that it was great because she's in my sales class and we talked about this before. <laughs> What happens when you park your nice new shiny car in front of your street and then your neighbors are walking by and you're getting the mail and they're like, hey Bob, that's a nice new car you got there. Hey, that car looks great in your driveway. You feel good riding it. You're like, ooh, I feel really nice in here. You look pretty, I can imagine you in a new car. It'd be a really good image. And then you're like, oh, I got to take this back now? But Taylor already knows I have it. And so you get that ownership that you've, you're emotionally attached to it before you've even spent money on it. So you're way more likely to be willing to give up more money for that continued enjoyment. Great question. Yeah. I'm going to go back to buying on the internet. Uh, how will the dynamics change, do you think, for scarcity and feeling you win or lose when you do, go online? So the, the online shopping, did you ask how will they change or how are they? Do, do you think they will change? Yeah. You know, so part of the problem is if you, if you go to, um, I'll use Elder Bierman, you can physically see how many products are on the shelf. <laughs> You go to Zara's, they can, they can have 20 shirts in the back and then just keep putting one out, one out. So I think the way that online retailers are trying to um, mimic that is the, like the steepandcheap.com example or woot.com. They'll have one product and, and they want to do the same thing that seeing the last record, the last jeans does to the buyer. You know, and now companies like Amazon don't seem to do that as much. They're very much like, we don't want to have scarcity at all. We want ubiquity. Okay. Amazon Prime Day. Amazon, oh yeah, so Amazon Prime Day, they, they do that, right? They're like, get here today. We're going to have one day where we want you to lose your mind and just buy everything based on, you're like, oh, I see it, I want it. It's like the impulse buying and it's, it's even easier buy. than, uh, yeah, yeah. one click buy. buy. One click buy is a scary feature. I actually take that off because I'm like, I could accidentally like hit it with my elbow and yeah, great, very, but great question. I think that's what they're trying to do and you know, mimic e-scarcity basically. So that's a great question. Yeah. I don't know if you've looked at online, not online, television, uh, phone shopping networks and they do the price of the day. They mm. do, um, you know, they do uh, partial payments. You can have five payments. Yeah. Tell you about the scarcity, and they tell you how it's going to change your life. Like, once you, where people are 
people down. And it's only for a limited time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, it's going to Talking about, <laughs> talking about, I'll get to one second. We're talking about TV shopping, and so they're doing all these things. This is how many are left. This is how it is. And we're, you know how I asked you how you think these 10 genes, you'd perceive quality versus this one pair? They're like, nah, we're telling you. This is awesome. You are going to, exactly. Yeah, you better you know, make this call quick because it, your life will never be the same without this BOA or whatever you're, you know, they're selling online, uh, vacuum cleaner or whatever. So great question. They're taking it a step further and trying to tell you how you think about a product and how it'll make you feel. Yeah, so Jordan? Be online, sure. there's, uh, it's not just us Americans that are using those tactics. Like, are other countries using the same, like culturally, is there a difference between um, the values? Well, yeah, so the question is, uh, are there cross-cultural differences, either on online shopping or actual um, big box, or uh, brick and mortar shopping? Um, all of my samples have been US based. That's a great question. I mean, using some you know, general cultural like Hofstede dimensions and things, I would imagine that it would be di that in the United States we are on, if there's a continuum of, of like firms trying to make you buy stuff, we are very far along that end because we value stuff, we're individualistic, we like winning, we're competitive. Um, and so my thought would be in certain uh, other more collective countries that don't value stuff as much, that it would be a little different. You know, what always, like the Netherlands and D Denmark, they always win the happiest people, and they always ask them why, and they're always like, because I don't have a ton of stuff. J uh, the Japanese, um, what's that, that book, the art, of, the art of Getting Rid of Crap, for better word. It's like the, how you makes you feel better. So that's my, the art of tidying up, yes. And, and it goes through this long process of how you should, goes back to your question, actually. Uh, Every item in your house, you should pick it up and decide, does this make me happy? And if you say no, send it off. So to your question, which is a great question, my guess is there would, you'd see some cultural differences. We're the most like, sort of frantically looking to buy things. But yeah, great question. Okay, one last question. Oh yeah, okay. Well, this comment I make culturally is the US uses a lot of credit. So a lot of your buying, you don't always feel the pain instantaneously. Ah. Countries where credit is much less, where you actually have to make a choice between maybe food and this thing, right. might change how you purchase. That's a great point. So the, the, talk, the thought of that Americans, we use credit a lot. And so there's instant gratification of getting something. And there's also, I don't know what that term would be, but the delayed negative impact of seeing your credit card bill. It's a lot easier to buy something and swipe it as opposed to taking money out and you know, putting it on the cash register. So that is a great point. Um, thinking of how this relates to e-shopping, it's very much not a physical thing, right? We're doing these things online, clicking, and then there's dollars zipping through the internet. So I bet the physical feeling of spending would, would change a lot. That's a great question. Okay, Thank oh, thanks, all right, thank you.